Glad you could be here. I'm Joe Esposito. How many people listen to me on radio? This is what I look like. <laughs> How disappointing, right? <laughs> So we're going to talk about today about the food hormone connection. Now a lot of times I tie this in with Valentine's Day, but a little early this year. But I want to talk about what happens when you put food in your body and how it affects your hormones. Because the hormones, we use some molecules of hormones and it alters every function of your life. And it's not just your sex drive. It's the color of your eyes, it, not the color of your eyes, it's the, the, how you see, it's how your hormones work, it's how your energy is, how your digestive system works. So hormones are really important. And what happens is, years ago, if we, years ago, in the 80s, way back, remember those days? Way back in the 80s, we didn't talk about the things we're talking about today because we started introducing a lot, new chem, a lot of new chemicals into our society. And a lot of these chemicals are called hormone disruptors. And they are exactly what they say they are. They disrupt your hormones. And when that happens, we have some real serious issues. So for example, this generation of kids, anybody have kids or grandkids? Okay, this generation of kids, the, that generation, is the first generation ever in the history of the world to have a shorter life expectancy than you by five years. See, so think about this. We have MRIs and CAT scans and robotics, and we can do surgery remotely now. We can have a robot go in, and the doctor can operate the cameras across the world. And yet, life expectancy is now down five years. Something's wrong there, isn't there? And a lot of it has to do with the chemicals that we call hormone disruptors. So there's a couple of glands that make hormones. Your pancreas make hormones, your testicles, your ovaries. The master gland, your pituitary gland controls the other hormones. And so we gotta be careful not to mess, remember the commercial, it's not nice to fool mother nature. We're fooling mother nature. So let's talk about how that all works. Let me first discuss hormone disruptors because that's kind of a biggie in this thing. Anything that gets into your body that looks like or acts like a hormone is called a hormone disruptor, an endocrine disruptor. Endocrine is the hormone system, same word. So if we have something like perfume, candles, hairspray, new car cleaner smell, carpet cleaners, these chemicals many times are endocrine disruptors. So who would have thought the chemical that you sprayed on your couch to clean that stain can mess with your estrogen levels. And it does. How about plastics? Plastics can cause endocrine disruption. There's a chemical called BPA. Anybody hear about that? BPA, bisphenol A. Bisphenol A acts as an endocrine disruptor. If you have a vinyl purse, plastic shower curtain, all these chemicals are now getting into our bodies. And what we used to think years ago, when I went to school, 100 years ago, we thought <laughs> that if you ate 3,500 uh, 3, calories, you would gain a pound. If you didn't eat 3,500 calories, you'd lose a pound. Pretty simple, right? Well, guess what? We now can gain weight with zero calories. Because if you put an endocrine disrupting hormone into your body, especially an estrogen-like compound, it acts like estrogen. Estrogen is a what? It's a growth hormone. Interesting. So now suddenly my plastic shower curtain could be causing me, along with a bad diet, to gain weight. My deodorants, my hairsprays, my colognes, the new car I just bought can now be causing us to gain weight, endocrine disruptors. Isn't that wild? And so we've got to be careful with that because if we have something like an estrogen compound, a phytoestrogen, a xenoestrogen, xeno means foreign, xenoestrogen, gets into the body and causes abnormal cell growth, what do we call that? Cancer. Cancer. Wow. So that's what's cool now is that the trend in cancer treatment is now going toward not just let's fight the cancer, let's prevent the cancer. And if you have cancer, let's fix it and then prevent it from coming back again. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? Yeah, so that's kind of cool. So let's talk about what would happen if I would eat the typical American diet, what would happen to my hormones? So let's assume you and I are gonna go out to dinner, ladies. Gentlemen, you're out of this one. <laughs> so I'm going to take you out to dinner. And we're going to go out for a typical romantic dinner. An American romantic dinner. What might that include? Steak, potatoes, wine, lobster, right? That sounds like a nice romantic meal, right? Let's see what happens to my hormones if I did that. So let's assume we're going to go out for steak. I'm a vegan, been a vegan for 30 years. 
I'm not asking you to be a vegan. I think you should. If you knew what I knew, you would. But I'm not asking you to do that. But we go out for a typical steak dinner. 1970s, eh, it's steak. Now, most commercial meats are fed with steroids, chemicals, hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, genetically modified foods. So now what used to be a piece of meat in the 70s and earlier is now a piece of meat with a bunch of chemicals in it. Chemicals that are hormone disruptors. So I'm going to have this piece of steak and many times they'll give horm uh, cows estrogen-like compounds to make them grow big and fat. Why? We sell meat by the pound. So the more poundage we have, the more we can charge. So I'm taking this into my body and a lot of times animals are fed antibiotics as well. And in fact, 70% of the antibiotics in this country are not used for humans. They're used for animals. So you're thinking, I haven't taken an antibiotic my entire life. Yeah, you have. If you're eating animal products, commercial animal products, you're eating these low-dose antibiotics. And these low-dose antibiotics get into your body and they start to kill off good bacteria and bad bacteria. And as the good bacteria start to die off, that affects your brain function. Your brain controls your hormones. Ah, huh. interesting. So we're going to go out and it's fine. I just saw a commercial today for one of the big uh, chicken companies. We never use antibiotics. We feed our chickens oregano. Because oregano is nature's antibiotic. So I thought that's pretty progressive. I don't agree with eating chickens, but I think that's pretty progressive. That they're feeding them oregano and then they can advertise no antibiotics. So if I have an infection, personally, I will take oregano oil. Because I know it works really well. But years ago that was scoffed at, now it's being advertised on TV. But back, back up a little bit. We can give cows hormones. We can't give chickens hormones. It's a law. But we can give them antibiotics, which act like hormones. Cause them to gain weight. Sell them by the pound. So we're going to go out with a steak, and I'm going to have a steak. It's loaded with steroids, chemicals, hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, and tranquilizers. The animal was, or the cow is fed genetically modified corn and soy. So the cow is big and fat. And I eat it, and it tastes good, from what I can remember. So I eat that steak. What am I doing to my hormones? That alone is messing with my hormones. Now the number one consumer of energy we have as humans is, no kids here, right? No kids? We'll keep making an adult lecture? Okay. The number one consumer of energy we have is, uh, making fun of her? Okay. <laughs> she have the mentality of a child? Is that what? Okay. <laughs> the number one consumer of energy is sex. The number two consumer of energy is digestion. digestion. And what's the hardest food to digest? Meat. So here I am, regardless of my hormones, I'm going on a date with you and I want to have a fun time and I'm going to eat meat, boom, there goes my energy. I don't want that. So we got to be careful what we're putting on our body, not just hormones, but also what, what's doing to our body from an energy level. So meat has a lot of these hormones and steroids and chemicals and they're estrogen-like compounds to try to put on weight. For the cow, I'm eating estrogen, estrogen counteracts my testosterone. Now we think of testosterone as a sex drive hormone, but testosterone also builds muscle. Not just your biceps and your triceps. How about your heart? Your heart's a muscle. How about your colon? Colon's a muscle. My blood vessels? Muscles. So I want to make sure my testosterone levels stay where they're supposed to be, because if they start to drop, some really important organs are now being affected. So why would I want to put an estrogen-like compound into my body to counteract my testosterone, not just for muscle mass and romance, but for my heart and the other organs, okay? So you see where we're starting to mess with Mother Nature here? Not good stuff. So that steak is going to take a lot of energy. It's going to clog up my colon. If it has antibiotics, it can start killing off the bacteria in my colon. And this is interesting too. Years ago, every now and then I'd have a patient come in and they'd have a yeast infection. And women, it was pretty obvious it was a vaginal infection and we knew it. But now we're starting to find out that men get yeast infections probably just as frequently as women. And it might show up as jock itch, athlete's foot. Got an email today from Guam, dandruff. These are all signs of systemic yeast infections. And what happens is I have bacteria in my colon and I have yeast. 
and they have a balance and they live happily ever after until I start messing with the balance and I start killing off the bacteria. And as the bacteria start to die off, the yeast are not affected by antibiotics. So now the yeast start to multiply and they burrow holes into my colon and get into my blood system. Now they're in the blood system and they've got to go somewhere. They're floating around the blood system. So I don't like hanging out in the blood system. I want to set up shop someplace warm and moist. Because they're yeast. Yeast likes warm and moist, right? You ever make bread? Water, sugar, and warmth. So now the yeast can set up shop in the groin, the armpits, the mouth, dandruff. These are usually signs of systemic yeast infections. And I had a girl come in the other day, a young girl, about 16 years old, and she listens to my show. And her and her mother said, I think she's got a yeast infection. I said, how do you know? She said, I did the test you told me to do. Anybody ever hear me talk about that test? Okay. Spit in a glass of water. <laughs> Take a clear glass of water first thing in the morning, big mouthful of spit, spit in a glass. As soon as you wake up, and within an hour or sooner, you're going to start to see strands like a jellyfish start to come down from the spit. If you see that, chances are you have a systemic yeast infection. She showed it to me. The whole glass was covered in these wands of yuck. I said, I would venture a guess that you have a yeast infection. Now, we could do stool samples to find out if you really do have one. But you know what? If you spit in a glass and you got the streamers, yeah, pretty much got one. Okay, I just saved you a whole bunch of money. And so we put her on a real strict protocol. But I said something too before. I don't know if you caught it. Yeast needs moisture, water, and sugar. So if you're eating sugar, you're feeding the yeast. Bacteria dying off from the antibiotics you ate, now the yeast start to multiply. 30 years ago, I didn't see the amount of yeast infections I'm seeing today. I see them constantly. And so it's a tough deal. Once it's a systemic yeast infection, it's a tough deal to get it out of your cells. And you've got to be real stringent. But we can do it. If you don't do it, it can lead to real serious problems, even things like cancer. Wow. Okay? So sugar's evil. And sugar messes with everything because sugar messes with your pancreas. And your pancreas produces insulin, which is a hormone. There you go. Okay? Vitamin D is a hormone too. How about that? Do you know that? It's not really a vitamin, it's a hormone. Useless fact. So, <laughs> but you eat sugar. I'm going to give you, I don't know, my romantic dinner and I'm taking out you ladies and we're going to have cheesecake for dessert. The sugar is going to cause my pancreas to release insulin. Insulin makes my cells open up and receive the glucose as a fuel to run the cells. With me so far? If I eat too much sugar, my body's producing too much insulin. They're telling all the cells, hey, every cell open up and let in more sugar. The cells go, I can't take any more sugar. It's going to gunk up the, the works. And so the body says, stop. I'm going to resist insulin from allowing me to take in sugar. And you create a condition called insulin resistance. That's where those words come from. See? Isn't that cool? And insulin resistance means your cells can't open up and take in the sugar. And so now the sugar is floating around in your blood. I've got to go somewhere. Can't go into cells. Sugar's an acid. Your, body, your blood starts to become slightly acidic. The body has to neutralize that acid. The body uses calcium as its primary neutralizing agent. Now suddenly, we're taking calcium out of the blood. We use up all the calcium in the blood. Where's our big store of calcium in the body? Bones. Bones. And so now the body starts giving up calcium to neutralize the acid because you messed with the hormones, insulin, and the cells became insulin resistant. And now the body starts to lose calcium. And now the doctor says, you, lady who's postmenopausal, have osteoporosis. It must be a hormone imbalance. Maybe it's a sugar imbalance or an acid imbalance. Seven foods are acid, right? Big seven. I call them the seven deadly sins. Alcohol, meat, sugar, dairy, coffee, soda, and artificial sweetener. My God, that's everything. <laughs> you want it faster or slower? <laughs> Alcohol, meat, sugar, dairy, coffee, soda, artificial sweetener. Or as Dr. Joe says it, alcohol, meat, sugar, dairy, coffee, soda, and artificial sweetener. <laughs> Those are the big seven. I call them the seven deadly sins. Under sugar, we have things like breads, cookies, cakes, donuts, and pastas. Wait a minute. That's sugar? Uh huh. Insulin resistance, too much insulin, we got a problem. 
if your brain becomes insulin resistant, it can lead to dementia. Your brain needs glucose to run, it's its primary fuel. If you have too much insulin trying to open up the brain cells and put in too much sugar, the brain becomes insulin resistant and now we call it type 3 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance in the body, type 3 is insulin resistance in the brain, leading to dementia. Is it the only cause of dementia? We don't know that yet. Is it the major cause? My opinion, absolutely yes. Because I've never known anyone who eats a good diet to have dementia. I've known a lot of people who eat a junky diet that have dementia. Now there are people who eat a junky diet don't have dementia too, but I think it depends how your body is predisposed. So we've got to be careful. Messing with Mother Nature and these insulin, these hormones, you've got a big issue. So if we're going to have sugar, you're killing yourself. And, good time to do it now, I guess. <laughs> got to talk about it. Come on, three years in the making, okay? It's out. Yay. But I have a, a chapter in here about the immune system and sugar. And I think I've got to remember the numbers. If I give you a soda's worth of sugar, about nine teaspoons of sugar, your immune cells can kill about 14 germs or pathogens before they die. If I give you a can of soda, those same white blood cells can kill one pathogen before they die. So now I'm blowing out my immune system just by eating sugar. Okay? So, if you don't have a copy of this book, you can't, because I just came out today. <laughs> Somebody does. One guy stole one from me. <laughs> But it's an awesome book. I have to say, Mary did an amazing job with me writing this book. Um, it cut, it's, it's all my lectures, all my teachings in one book. It's really, really cool. I recommend you get a copy of it. Um, it, it I'll sign it for you. I don't want to see it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> this book, when it went on eBay and signed, sold for $85. So I don't want this going on eBay. Okay. You'll be buying like a case of them, right? <laughs> sign them all. They're all for uh, me. Yeah, they're for me. <laughs> Anyway, it's a great book, Prescription for Extreme Health, and it really is exactly that. It's a prescription for extreme health. I don't want you to be healthy. I want you to be extremely healthy. I used to date a girl, and she had a saying, she said, moderation is for monks. And I love that phrase, moderation is for, it is. I don't want to be moderate, I want to be extreme. I want you to have extreme health, and so this book is, we have them here, so it's available first time ever. So you guys get the first shot of anyone in the whole world at them, how about that? So. We talk about sugar a lot in there because sugar is really bad. So we're messing with the hormones when it comes to sugar. We're messing with the hormones when it comes to animal products. So if you eat animal products, <coughs> I don't think you should. But if you do, because I'm a realist, I want you to eat organic only. The reason is we're taking out of the equation the steroids, chemicals, hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, and genetically modified foods that shouldn't be there to begin with. A couple of things happen when you eat organic food, uh, or organic meats anywhere, dairy, animal products. Number one, is a lot less of it, so you don't have as much option to eat them. Number two, it's more expensive. So if you're cheap, I'll motivate you. <laughs> and what'll happen is you'll start to add more plant-based food into your diet. And now the body starts to work. So we'll talk about estrogens for a second. Plants have something in it called phytoestrogens. Phyto means plant. Estrogen means estrogen. So the phytoestrogens can actually block up your receptor sites where, estrogen, where these xenoestrogens would be absorbed and prevent you from absorbing them. So the more plants or plant-based diet you eat, the better you're going to be at blocking your body from absorbing the bad chemicals and the bad estrogens. And the more plants you eat, the less you're going to have exposure to these xenoestrogens and so you got a double whammy. So the, the great news is a plant-based diet solves a lot of your problems when it comes to hormones. With me so far? Okay, if I lose you, stop me, okay? Right, let's talk about where the hormones are produced. Gentlemen, you have your testicles, ladies, you have your ovaries. All of us have something called adrenal glands. And adrenal glands sit right here. They sit on top of your kidneys. And they're about the size of a walnut. <clears throat> and with the adrenal glands, they have three layers. And I've dissected adrenal glands, I've cut them open, and you can clearly see the three layers. It's very obvious. One layer produces something called adrenaline. Adrenaline gives you energy, right. Another layer produces uh, 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 chemicals that induce inflammation and, de and fight inflammation. Because prostaglandin E2 and E3. 
Prostaglandins are the things that mediate inflammation. So if I were to scratch myself, I would create an inflammatory reaction. So right now my adrenal glands are saying, okay, there's an inflammatory reaction, let's send out some inflammatory cells. Now my body says, that was no big deal, nothing to worry about. It sends out other modulators to say, all right, stop the inflammation. Okay. And so the adrenal glands do a lot of different things. They also produce something called pregnenolone. Here comes your hormones. Pregnenolone becomes DHEA. DHEA becomes your sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. If you're under stress, the DHEA, instead of becoming your sex hormones, becomes something called cortisol. Cortisol is your stress hormone. Cortisol does several things. It causes you to gain weight, because you lay down fat, weakens your immune system over time. Now, sometimes it's good. You need cortisol every day, but too much of it is when we start to have a problem. So eventually, if you put too much stress on your adrenal glands, they burn out. The adrenal glands burn out, you have adrenal insufficiency or adrenal fatigue. And how do you know you have adrenal fatigue? Well, we could do a spit test on you. We have, uh, at our office, we do a saliva test on our patients, and we can measure your cortisol levels. <coughs> but we can also look at the body. Big bags under the eyes, good sign of adrenal fatigue. Most people, as we get older, have adrenal fatigue. So a simple thing to do is nourish your adrenal glands. And you do that several ways. Number one is cut out your stimulants. Uh-oh. Is he going to say the C word? Coffee? <laughs> yes, I am. Because coffee will burn out your adrenal glands, the caffeine. Anybody know how caffeine works? Everybody knows it works. Nobody knows how it works, right? Okay. You have a chemical in your brain called adenosine. Adenosine is released into your brain and it's absorbed in something called an adenosine receptor site. So adenosine is released into the adenosine receptor sites and the adenosine receptor sites now tell the body to get tired. So when you're tired, your adenosine is released into your adenosine receptor sites and the brain says, I need to rest. I need to rest and reboot. Caffeine looks like the adenosine, rece adenosine. So it blocks up your adenosine receptor sites and you can't absorb adenosine. So coffee doesn't give you energy. Coffee prevents you from getting tired. Does that make sense? Okay? And so that's why when you drink one cup of coffee initially, you're wired. Blocking up the adenosine receptor sites. Now, your brain is smarter than you. Your brain says, hey, wait a minute, I need to rest. I'm going to produce more adenosine receptor sites. So what do you need more of now? More coffee. So when you drank one cup of coffee at work, then you started drinking two, then four, then six, then eight. And your brain is fighting you. Your brain is saying, no, I need to rest. And you're not letting it rest. So what happens is you start coming off the coffee and you get a what? Headache. It's okay. You need to wean yourself off the coffee because the body has to reboot and start producing normal amounts of adenosine receptor sites to utilize the adenosine. And we do that by cutting back the coffee. In my first book, Eating Right for the Health of It, we have a chapter on that. It's called Kicking the Habit. And if you're on coffee or soda or any type of stimulating drink, I recommend you take one tablespoon every hour. No cream, no sugar, this is not for fun. One tablespoon of, 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 of caffeine drink, whatever it is, and that will slow down your body and, get, and, and kind of get you off the drug. I used to say caffeine is the number one most abused drug in the world, and I lied. It's sugar. There you go. Somebody said it. It's sugar. Okay? So we've got to get you off the caffeine. And that's a good way to get off the caffeine. The other problem with coffee is it's an acid. And an acid robs your body of what? Calcium. Quiz time. Good job. Okay, so you're robbing your body of calcium, sucking out the bones, and then you have to, it messes with your hormones because the hormones actually drive the, 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 chem, the uh, calcium into the bones. So now you're messing with your hormone levels again. But coffee, back to hormones, is also probably the most, if not one of the most sprayed foods in the world. When I say sprayed, it's sprayed with chemicals. And a lot of the chemicals we use on our food are endocrine disruptors. 
because when we spray when we spray a chemical on the food, it does one of two things: it kills the bug directly, or it alters the hormones in the bug, so it can't make more bug babies. And if you're reading the hormone-altering bug baby hormone <laughs> chemical disruptor, just made that up. Uh, <laughs> write that down. That's funny. Okay, now <laughs> little doses of these bug baby disruptors are going to get into you and create a problem. So coffee is really a highly sprayed food. So when I deal with my patients, every patient that comes into our offices, we have offices in Marietta, Duluth, and now Stockbridge. When patients come into our offices, we want to check their nervous system, we want to check their digestive system, and we want to check their diet. Okay, and that's what really kind of separates us from most doctors in the world because we cover those three things in one place. And whether the patient, is, I, I work in a Marietta office, but I have doctors that are trained by me that cover the other offices. And when anybody comes in, I always want to do a nutrition evaluation with them. So they, we like to see new patients in the Marietta office if we can, but I can always do a phone consultation with the patient if I have to. Because the radio show, by the way, is now nationally and probably this year internationally syndicated. Canada is looking to pick up the show. And this year, most likely, we're going to turn the radio show into a TV show. Which is pretty cool. Okay, yay! So it's kind of fun, yeah. Because it's funny, the, the, the guys from the, radio, the, t the TV stations came and they said, We want to make your radio show into a TV show. And I said, It's me looking at a microphone. <laughs> it's not that exciting, okay? And they came down and they said, Because I do my radio show like this, so I'm talking to a wall. And, uh, and they said, No, you'd be great on it. And I said, Okay, so it's going to be a TV show too. So I like to do a nutritional consultation with my patients because I want to get the structure working. I want to get your nervous system working. I want to make sure your digestive system is working. Remind me to talk about digestive hormones, okay? And I want to make sure that we have the diet correct. And we approach it from those three things, you actually now have a health care plan. Most people don't have a health care plan. They might have health insurance, they don't have a health care plan. I want to put together a protocol for you so that you can get well. And if you do it, the chances are very high you'll get great results. The few patients that don't get good results in our offices, most of them have one thing in common. They didn't do it. <laughs> I can't get big biceps unless I lift weights. I can't buy the weights and have them sitting there and go, eh, it ain't working. <laughs> so, so you have to do it. And the fun part is it's easy, it's quick, it's inexpensive, and it's a blast when you start getting healthy. I've been sick and I've been healthy. Trust me, healthy is a lot more fun. So we've got to get the nervous system working because the nervous system controls the endocrine system. Right now my brain is sending a message to my adrenal glands, to my pancreas, to my reproductive organs, to my pituitary gland, to my thyroid, which is another hormone lecture I can give an hour just on a thyroid if I wanted to. So we've got to get the nerves going to the organs right. We've got to get your digestive system working properly so you can absorb your nutrients and pass out your waste products. Don't forget digestive hormones. And we've and we got to get your diet straightened out. And sometimes you need supplements. I take adrenal supplements every single day because as I'm getting older, my adrenal glands are getting weaker. Well, I'm going to fight it. And I take adrenal supplements every day to keep my adrenals healthy to produce my pregnenolone, my DHEA, my testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, keep my cortisol at bay get my adrenaline working properly, manufacture uh, prostaglandins which can mediate my inflammation. I want to make sure I got all that working. Okay? So yeah, I have my own supplement protocol that I've put together for myself and every patient that comes in we customize a supplement plan for them. Most people similar plans because most of us are, we, we have basic core needs. Okay? And that's where we go. So that's why I have Dr. Joe's Supergreens and Dr. Joe's Essential Source. Because those are the core supplements everybody should be taking. If you haven't taken these yet, you need to. Okay? Essential source, raw fruits and vegetables in a powder form. Enzymes, remember we talked about enzymes too. Raw fruits and vegetables, in, oh my God, that's two things. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> teach you to sit up front. So, you need enzymes. I'm gonna talk about enzymes, you're gonna remind me. And it's a prebiotic, probiotic, good bacteria, digestive enzymes, and a complete multivitamin. Then, most of us are too acidic. Remember acid, calcium, the whole bit? So I created Dr. Joe's Super Greens to alkalize the system, give you omega-3 fatty acids, and give you something that almost everybody in this room, I can almost guarantee, is deficient in. There's two nutrients almost everybody's deficient in. Magnesium. Magnesium. Th there's three nutrients <laughs> that almost everybody is deficient in. <laughs> Iodine. Iodine. There you go. 
So I take a scoop of this every day, a scoop of each. I mix it with coconut milk. Um, kids, this is a great way to get kids to supercharge themselves. Get a frozen banana, a little bit of coconut milk, put it in a food processor. Love it. And it tastes great too. Okay? So if you're not taking this yet, you need to be. This is the basis. This is the starting point for everybody. Okay? So, so we got three nutrients. Digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes and? <sighs> Digestive hormones. That's your job. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so three nutrients are all deficient in. Number one, vitamin D, which is not a nutrient, really. It's a hormone. Everybody should be taking vitamin D every day. 3,000, uh, 5,000 international units is what a, an adult would need. If you're not taking vitamin D in the winter, you need to be. Because very seldom does somebody come to my office and have a blood work done and their normal vitamin D levels. Okay, so vitamin D, 5,000 international units. I would recommend you take vitamin D3, not vitamin D2. Because doctors prescribe vitamin D2. You come to an ordinary doctor and we get blood work on you, you're low in vitamin D, I'm going to give you a 50,000 international unit prescription for vitamin D2. It's about 500 times less effective than vitamin D3 and it's usually more expensive. Less effective, more expensive. Not part of the Dr. Joe healthcare plan. I like less expensive, more effective. Okay? So 5,000 three, three, IUs or international units. There's three sources. Number one is fish. I don't like the fish oil. It can be contaminated with mercury and lead and polyvinyl chloride and other toxins. Lanolin comes from sheep wool. Whoever figured that out? No idea. <laughs> what if sheep wool has vitamin D in it? Oh, look at that. It does. So, Lanolin's a good source. It's relatively inexpensive. The third is the, uh, comes from algae. It's much more expensive. They all work. Vitamin D3, not D2. Okay? Iodine. Every cell in your body needs iodine, not just your thyroid gland. Every cell in your body has an iodine receptor site. We don't know why. A lot of cells in your body, we don't know why it has an iodine receptor site, but it does. But you need iodine. Most of us get no quality iodine in our diet. So where do we get it from? I put dults, I put sea vegetables in my super greens and my essential source. So I know I'm getting plenty of iodine every day. And then magnesium, good point. Magnesium relaxes your muscles, relaxes your blood vessels, makes your bowels move. Too much magnesium, you get diarrhea. What do we make milk of magnesia out of? Magnesium, makes your bowels relax. Most of us are magnesium deficient. If you're eating a good plant-based diet, which you should be anyway, you don't have to worry about magnesium deficiency. If you're not eating a plant-based diet, you probably do. So what do you need to do? Eat more plants, okay? So we're gonna cover <laughs> digestive hormones. Okay, good. Digestive hormones, back to hormones again. Your stomach produces a hormone called leptin. I remember a couple of years ago we discovered this and it, we thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Leptin is released in your stomach, gets into your blood system, goes into your hypothalamus in your brain and tells you that you are full. There you go. So of course the first original research was, oh my God, this is great. If I gave everybody leptin as an injection or a drug or a, a supplement, your hypothalamus would say you're full, you'd eat less, we'd all lose weight, right? Sounds like a good idea. We tried it. Didn't work because your brain can become leptin resistant. Just like it can become insulin resistant. Too much of a good thing. Brain says, I, I'm t I can't be full all the time. And the hypothalamus stops listening. Then you're hungry all the time. So your stomach's job is to produce leptin, send it into the blood system, go up to the hypothalamus, tell you that you're full. This is why the secret to eating and balancing your leptin is to eat a little bit of food and stop. Because it takes 20 minutes to get the message from your stomach to your hypothalamus, to your brain. Most of us, myself included, don't do that. We eat as much as we can in 20 minutes. <laughs> and then you feel like, careful, it's a family show. <laughs> Crud. So <laughs> And they say, I ate too much, I can't believe I ate so much, I'm so full, I'm never going to eat again. Until... <laughs> See, I'm just like you guys, I'm no different than you. Until we, that passes into the small intestine, the small intestine produces ghrelin, not gremlin, ghrelin, and that goes up to the hypothalamus and says, I'm hungry. 
And so now we start throwing off the, the ghrelin and the leptin. Well, in recent times, we started messing with Mother Nature again and Mother Nature's hormones. And we used to have something called sugar. Remember sugar? Well, what do we have now? It's cheaper than sugar and sweeter than sugar. High fructose corn syrup. Stevie, I'll get to Stevie if you remind me. High fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup stops your production of leptin, but stimulates your production of ghrelin. Which means what? You're more... So if I ate plain sugar, that's bad. When I eat high fructose corn syrup, I'm messing with my hormones, and it's worse. Now, it's hard to find high fructose corn syrup, right? It's only in everything, in everything right? Okay. <laughs> it's in ketchup, it's in sodas. Now, what's interesting, too, is high fructose corn syrup is usually made from genetically modified corn and or beets. A lot of countries have banned genetically modified foods especially Europe. And so if I go to Europe, quote, don't quote me on this statistic, 70, 80%, 80% of the foods that you can buy in a grocery store in the United States, I think I'm right on this statistic, you can't buy in Europe. Because they've banned genetically modified foods and other things. They won't buy a lot of our meat because of the steroids, hormones, chemicals, antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, tranquilizers. High fructose corn syrup, genetically modified, can't buy it there. So if you go to Europe, you might find a soda, same brand as you buy here in the States, made with sugar. Ketchup made with sugar. Candies made with sugar. Latin America, they make sodas with sugar because they found the Latin American community doesn't like high fructose corn syrup, they like sugar. Had nothing to do with a ban on it, they just found that the tastes were different. Different communities have different tastes. And so, High fructose corn syrup messes with your hormones, which can make you fat. Because you're hungry all the time. If I eat artificial sweeteners, my, my tongue says, that was sweet. Sweet sends a message to the brain to tell this message to the pancreas saying, here comes sugar. Start making insulin. But now there's a problem. There's no sugar. So now the body's pumping out all this insulin. The body says, we need some sugar to use up this insulin start craving sweets. This is why people that eat diet sodas or diet candies usually gain weight. Because you're messing with your sugar and now you become insulin resistant because you have too much insulin. So how does insulin resistance lead to getting fat? Your brain's exploding, isn't it? It's just amazing. <laughs> She's over going, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> it's amazing what you're saying because I've experienced that. You know, I'm a vegan now, right. I don't do sugar. Right. But when I was drinking diet soda, I was I didn't know why I wanted candy afterwards and stuff. And here you are saying Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. You've learned more in 35 minutes than most people have learned in a lifetime. You know that. So yeah. <laughs> That goes for all of you, by the way. <laughs> so how do you get fat? And how does insulin resistance lead to fat? And what does fat have to do with hormones? What do you still have to talk about? Digestive. Digestive enzymes. Okay, good. Making sure. Make sure the brain's still working. So. <laughs> All right, so let's go off on a tangent here again on hormones. I eat a lot of sugar. My pancreas releases insulin. Insulin goes into the cells. The cells become insulin resistant. The sugar stays in my blood. My body has to neutralize the acid by using calcium to neutralize the acid. But that sugar's still there. So that sugar goes into my liver, liver, and my cells and my muscles and gets stored as something called glycogen. Glycogen is my storehouse for energy. So when I run out of glucose, my the glycogen goes into the liver, gets converted into glucose, goes up into my brain. And into my body, it's used as fuel. Once all my glycogen stores are filled up, I've got a problem. I'm still eating sugar. I'm Joe America. I'm eating Captain and Joe. So, and I'm still eating sugar. My glycogen stores are filled up. My cells can't take any more glucose. That glucose can't stay in the blood because it's an acid. The glycogen, the, 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 sugar get, the sugar gets sent back to the liver, gets converted into something called triglycerides. Triglycerides get stored as fat. That's how sugar makes you fat. Fat, ironically, does not do that. So this is why the research now is showing you need to eat more fat. 
and you should make about 50% of your diet fat and you'll lose weight. Because too much protein, remind me to talk about fat and, fat and hormones. Fat and hormones, okay, okay, good. Got a lot going on here today. Had a week off without lecturing in radio shows. Got a lot going on up here, so. Fat and hormones, okay? All right, okay. She's the smart one, she wrote it down, see? She's prettier than you and she's smarter than you. <laughs> He looks. She's prettier than you, trust me. <laughs> so you're eating fat, but if you eat too much protein, remember that big protein craze, lose weight on protein? That was a great idea. It worked, because you weren't eating sugar, wasn't converting it to triglycerides, triglycerides sort of fat, so you were losing weight. The problem is too much protein stimulates something called the MTOR pathway in your body, the mTOR. The mTOR pathway leads to cancer cell production. Uh-oh. Were we wrong eating all these protein diets? Did I warn you about it 30 years ago? Did you listen to me? Now you're listening. Okay? So too much protein's not good and too much sugar's no good. What's left? Fat. Carbs are sugar. Fat. So you can eat more fat and lose weight. And the cool thing is this. When you eat fat, it makes you feel full. So you don't eat as much. That's why if you ever eat a low fat diet, you're hungry all the time. You eat a high fat diet, you're not hungry all the time. So what are some good fats? Coconut oil, Coconut oil avocados, olive oil, walnuts. walnuts, walnut oil, good. Guys are smart. So more fat, better, as long as it's a good fat. If it's a bad fat, like an omega-6 fatty acid, let's say, that can cause inflammation, putting a strain on your adrenal glands. Remember adrenal glands? <coughs> now we've got a problem. Adrenal glands burn out, they can't produce adrenaline, you get tired all the time, they can't produce the prostaglandins, they can't produce your DHEA, which becomes your sex hormones, and there's your sex hormone mess up. So fat is going to be a good thing, but what are, what are omega-6 fatty acids? Corn oil, soy oil, Vegetable oil, most hydrogenated oils, which are going to be being banned, by the way. I win, again. <laughs> so good fats, good, bad fats, bad. It's very simple. Joe, what about safflower and sunflower oil? Safflower and sunflower are omega-6s again, so I wouldn't recommend them. Yeah, okay? About 50% of your intake of, of your food all day. But what's going to happen is if you're eating a lot more oil, you're going to eat a lot less food because you're not going to be as hungry. Okay? Yes. Say coconut oil or coconut milk? Coconut oil. Coconut milk usually has a lot of sugar in it. Now I use coconut milk, but coconut oil is going to be key. Yes. So what if you're allergic to those things? What things? Avocado or... Um, okay, if you're allergic to certain nuts, then go with the other nuts. Okay? And if you're allergic to avocados, then go with uh, uh, like uh, almond oil maybe. If it's almond is a problem, find the oil that you don't have a problem with. Ovo olive oil. Olives are great too, by the way. So when you make a salad, always add olives to it. Yes? Protein, because I'm, I'm a vegan, too much, too much protein, protein from, the, from the hemp powder causes the MTOR. Too much protein can stimulate the MTOR production, yeah. Okay. Now, you're going to have to take a lot of hemp protein to have that problem. But a little bit of meat, no big deal. I'm trying to build muscle, so just cut down. For just a regular person, you need about 8% of your total caloric intake is protein. Not a lot. If you're an Olympic athlete, 10%, 12%. I have a whole chapter in here. My bonus section is on athletes in this book. Okay? You don't need a lot of protein even as a professional athlete. And you're finding a lot of professional athletes now going to a plant-based diet and their performance is skyrocketing. Okay, so don't worry about the protein thing. So, you don't need a lot of protein because it can stimulate the MTOR production which can lead to cancers. So you gotta eat a lot of fat. And the more fat you eat, the less food you eat, save a ton of money, you'll feel better. It's just that simple. Okay? Digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes, okay. Let's talk about enzymes for a second because enzymes are a key player here. When you're young, your body's pumping out enzymes like crazy. Now what the heck is an enzyme? An enzyme is a thing, in the book, that makes this and this come together and form this new component. So an enzyme will make calcium become bone, and it'll, uh, cal mag magnesium relax muscles. Nothing happens unless an enzyme makes it happen. When you're young, you're producing a ton of enzymes. As you get older, your enzyme levels drop. Your pancreas produces enzymes, your saliva produces enzymes, your liver produces enzymes, stomach produces enzymes, enzymes are everywhere. 
But as you're getting older, your enzyme levels are dropping. So what happens is, as your enzyme levels drop, you age. Aging, I'm going to kind of go against modern, current thought process. Aging is not a reduction in enzyme, is not a reduction in enzyme production. Reduction in enzyme production is aging. Follow that? So the way to fight that is to get more enzymes in your body. Where do we get enzymes from? Raw food. Anything cooked above 110 degrees. <laughs> Am I plugging the book today? Enough plugs? Okay. Anything cooked above 110 degrees, the enzymes are destroyed. So I don't care if it's a steak or a carrot, you're destroying the enzymes. So I want you to do some cer certain things. Okay. Number one is I want to make sure you eat something raw at every meal. Now when I say raw, it could be broccoli, cucumbers, tomatoes, salad, avocados. I don't care what it is, something raw at every meal. If you're lazy, we now have prepackaged raw food. Salads, coleslaws. <laughs> bought a package of, I, I can't believe I did this. I love cooking. I, I bought a package of, of, of organic prepackaged coleslaw, shredded cabbage. <laughs> okay? And I added some nutritional yeast to it. I added some apple cider vinegar, which stimulates your digestive enzymes. Good boy. Okay, he's getting it, see? And, uh, <laughs> Stimulates the digestive enzymes, I added some, uh, some, uh, and I added some fat to it, I added some avocado to it, some olives and some olive oil, and boy, what a wonderful meal that was. And it probably cost me a buck fifty. People say, I, don't have, I, don't, I can't afford to eat well, I don't have time to eat well. You don't have time not to eat well. It's so easy, I bought the bag of coals, dumped it in there, boop, 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 maybe four minutes total, and that was it, it was done. Ate it, a lot of fiber, felt full, a lot of fat, felt full. Felt great. Fiber, uh, the, the, the raw vegetables have uh, pro co components in there that feed my, bacteri my, my bacteria, bacteria in my colon called probiotics. And probiotics feed the good bacteria. Prebiotics are the good bacteria. Now if you're eating cabbage, while I'm off on this tangent, why do you think cabbage makes good sauerkraut? Cabbage has a bunch of probiotics in it already. So if you're eating it raw, you're eating a bunch of prebiotics and probiotics to feed the bacteria in my colon. So speaking of that, what about fermenting foods? What about fermenting? Excellent. One of the best foods you can eat are fermented foods. However, if you buy them bought, they have to be pasteurized. If you pasteurize, you can kill off a lot of bacteria. So making your own is really the best way to go, if you're so inclined. Yes? You say yeast? Yeast Nutritional yeast, which is different than the yeast we were talking about. <coughs> Nutritional yeast is something that, um, it is a yeast, but it's loaded with all, uh, all, uh, all eight essential amino acids, or nine, depending who you talk to. Also has uh, B12 and other B vitamins in it. Because as a vegan, I, my source of B12, I get from, my colon makes it, but I get my B12 from an external source. If you're a meat eater, B12 is when bacteria rot, eat the rotten flesh, they produce B12. So, if you've never had nutritional yeast, I recommend buying it in a bulk section. It's a lot cheaper, and it's the tastiest one I've ever had. And I sprinkle, you know, sprinkle as much as you want on. Two tablespoons, one, you know, whatever. It kind of almost sort of tastes like cheese. Not really, but sort of. Yeah, and it tastes great, yeah. It tastes great, and boy, you get a burst of energy. Holy cow, it's crazy how much energy you get when you take it because of all the B vitamins. Okay? So if we keep our bacteria healthy and we keep our adrenal glands healthy, we keep our thyroid healthy, we've got to feed these organs so they can produce the hormones. And if not, you're messing with your hormones. So as a chiropractor, I always want to check several things. I want to check the nerve supply to every one of your organs. Because if I have a pinched nerve going to my adrenal glands, my thyroid, my kidneys, my spleen, my pancreas, the brain can't tell those organs how to work because I'm blocking the message. It's working, but not at 100%. So as a chiropractor, I want to check the alignment of, this, of every bone in the body, all 206 bones, to see if there's any pinched nerves. Then I want to make sure your digestive system is working. Because what happens is, and this, I find this about 80% of my patients, you have a sheet of muscle here called your diaphragm. Below your diaphragm sits your stomach. And there's a hole in your diaphragm where food drops in called the lower esophageal sphincter, and the food drops in the hole and goes into the stomach, the hole closes, so the food doesn't come back up again, the stomach digests the food with digestive enzymes, <laughs> breaks the proteins into amino acids. The amino acids go into the small, the, the, un, the partially digested food goes into the small intestine. The small intestine now produces protease, amylase, and lipase, digestive enzymes to break down fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Breaks them down, they get absorbed in my small intestine, the bacteria assist. 
And then it goes into my large intestine where the water is taken out, it's packed, and it's passed out. That's a normal, healthy digestive system. Most people, when I say most, well over 50%, the stomach is pushing up into the diaphragm. When the stomach pushes up into the diaphragm, you might have things like acid reflux, heartburn, burping, gas, bloating, sore throat, chronic cough, sinus problems. See, acid is coming all the way up into the sinuses. And too much acid in the esophagus leads to something called esophageal cancer. There we go. Yeah. So what we have to do oftentimes is manually pull the stomach down away from the diaphragm. So if the God, is that you? <laughs> if you can't hear it on tape, there's bells going off here. So. so the stomach can be pushed up against the diaphragm. We need to pull the stomach down away from the diaphragm, manually moving the stomach so that it can digest food, pass into the small intestine, and do its job. So many times, people's health care problems are physical, not chemical. We keep trying to treat them chemically, and we don't get the results. Not against surgery. I'm not against drugs. I'm against unnecessary use of surgery and drugs. And this is why we get so many patients referred to us from doctors literally all over the world. Saying, Dr. Joe, we don't know what to do with this patient anymore. We've tried this, we've tried that, it's not working. Will you take a look at him for us? And my team of doctors, I have six doctors that I've trained, we take a look at them and we say, yeah, I think we need to fix the stomach and the spine and the pinched nerve going to the pancreas and the liver, the spleen. And then we work together with the patients. I have patients I've referred out for cancer treatment. And they send them back to me. I said, Joe, thank you, we did our job, now you work with them with the nutrition and the chiropractic, we work together. That's healthcare. It's not my patient. If I can't fix them, nobody can fix them. It's not true. I don't, don't, I don't do dental work. I have dentists I refer you out to, I can't fix a dental problem. I have psychiatrists I work with. I have gynecologists I work with. So we work very closely, I have a, a, a close-knit team of doctors that I work with so that your health is at all our primary concerns. And I tell all my doctors, you know what, there's plenty of patients out there. When we get everybody well, then we can start fighting over the patient. But until that happens, I want to work with you, you want to work with me. And that's what's so exciting about healthcare now as opposed to even 30 years ago when I first started this mess. It's a lot more fun now because everybody's working together. And when patients get well, I'm excited, they're excited. And some of my biggest referrers I've ever had in my life are patients I didn't treat. You know what? You're out of my ballpark. I need to send you over here. Wow. He was honest with me. What a concept. So, <laughs> so we got to get those things working. So if you have pinched nerves, you might have neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, but 90% of your nerves don't feel pain. You don't feel your hormone system. So the hormone system can be out of whack and you don't know it because you don't feel it. That's why we do blood work on patients and say, oh my gosh, you have diabetes. Oh my gosh, you have a low thyroid. Your adrenal glands are shot. We found it on blood work because you didn't have a symptom. So we like to make sure the spine and all the nerves are being unpinched the best we can. We want to make sure the digestive system is working the best we can. And we want to make sure that you're getting the proper supplements. That's why I, I recommend everybody start with Dr. Joe's Super Greens and Dr. Joe's Essential Source. Vitamin D3, buy it cheap. 5,000 international units a day. And then we like to add things like Magnesium. Magnesium. And then the iodine's already in the super greens, the essential source. Okay? So that's the minimum amount of nutrients that you need to start your day. Then you eat a good diet, so you're getting enough protein, but not too much. You're getting a fat, but not too much. And you eat less food and live a lot longer. And a lot healthier. So, we want to get the nervous system working, digestive system working, and good nutrition. That's why patients come to us. I'm going to go to questions right now, as a matter of fact. Patients come to us with neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, numbness, tingling, car accident cases. If you heard me on the radio say this a lot, if you've ever been in a car accident, if the car was damaged, you were damaged. How often? 100% of the time. Sometimes the insurance company said, well, you only had $800 worth of damage to your car, you weren't hurt. What does the damage to your car have to do with you? Your head did this. <laughs> Your head wasn't strapped in. And so, yeah, but we like to work with our patients. Okay? So, um, at, at how does this diet tie in with maybe assisting with like serotonin 
serotonin production for anxiety or depression. God, that's a whole lecture, but I'm going to give you two in 30 seconds. Your stomach's job is to take proteins and break them into amino acids. The amino acid tryptophan combines with vitamin B6 and creates a chemical called 5-HTP. 5-HTP becomes serotonin. Every single case in 35 years of seeing patients that has anxiety, depression, bipolar, ADD, ADHD, even suicidal, has an undiagnosed digestive problem. And we pull the stomach away from the diaphragm, get you on some raw foods, get the proteins being broken into amino acids so we can produce the serotonin. You can't produce serotonin without the raw materials. Fun fact, serotonin becomes melatonin, which helps you sleep. That's why most people with anxiety, depression, ADD can't sleep. They're not producing serotonin, so they can't produce melatonin. Or not enough. Did you discuss that in your book? Um, uh, I think I discussed that in this book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? How much... Uh Beet yeah, I did. Beet powder. I should have talked about beet powder. You're right. Beet powder, wonderful. Everybody should add that too if you want to have good circulation. About a half a teaspoon. Beet powder has nitrates in it, naturally occurring nitrates. Nitrates convert into nitric oxide. Nitric oxide opens up your blood vessels. So about a half a teaspoon. I'll mix it in with my super greens and essential source. If you want to stabilize your blood sugar and have energy throughout the day, add about a half a teaspoon of cinnamon as well. And add it with the super greens and the essential source. Yes. Yes, well, when I start to see Parkinson's and leg cramps, we start to see A, magnesium deficiencies for the leg cramps. Magnesium helps relax the blood vessels for blood flow to the brain, but also Parkinson's, we have to increase the dopamine levels. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that suppresses other neurotransmitters. So when I see Parkinson's, you can't suppress the tremors. So when I fix the digestive system to break the proteins into amino acids, glutamine becomes dope, uh, beca uh, tyrosine, tyrosine becomes dopamine. Okay? Tyrosine becomes dopamine. Dopamine also gives you pleasure. It's your pleasure neurotransmitter. So fixing the digestive system allows you to produce the tyrosine to produce the dopamine, which helps the production suppressing the other neurotransmitters. And with the leg cramps, any type of physical problem always, always, always think about your spine. Pinch nerve in the low back controls the legs, got to fix that. The low back also controls the colon, sex organs, and bladder. So almost every patient that comes to see us that has a back problem and leg problems has colon, sex organ, and or bladder problems. Fixing that nerve opens it up. Okay, yes? Have you ever had patients that have had tooth resorptions, like the uh, actual ball loss from a tooth? Yes. Absolutely, and that's a challenge right there. I like to work with certain dentists on that one to get it fixed, and then we gotta get the body healthy enough to start laying down new bone. But the answer is yes, and that's where I co-manage a case. Yes? On the plant-based diet, um, do they need to be organic? Plant-based diet organic is preferred, but if you can't do organic, at least I'd rather see you have a plant-based diet than an animal-based diet. But organic is always the best, yes, in everything. Um, what made you go vegan? Maybe go vegan. I was studying nutrition uh, 30 years ago and I was trying to figure out why my sinuses ran all the time. And I couldn't figure it out and I was working on my first degree in nutrition. I'm board certified in chiropractic, orthopedics, pain management, double board certified in nutrition, BS in nutrition, a retired dietitian. This book was an award winning book. This book will be an award winning book, I promise. And of course my radio shows and my research. But uh, I was studying nutrition for my BS, my first degree in nutrition, and I thought what makes sense? And the only thing that made sense was a plant-based diet. And it took me about six months to make that decision. And December 25th, 1986, I had the last piece of meat I had. It was spare ribs. It was really good. And I, <laughs> not going to lie to you. I am Italian. And that was it. I've never had animal products since. Okay. But if you knew what I knew, you would do what I do. If you knew what I knew, you'd, ne you'd do everything I do. I promise you. Yes. What are your thoughts about organic decaffeinated coffee and... Do you have any suggestions for a large prostate? Yes, if, you ha if you're going to drink coffee, organic decaf is the way to go. I prefer you don't drink coffee, but organic decaf is the way to go. If it's not organic decaf, they might use things like turpentine and formaldehyde to take the caffeine out. So organic decaf is the way to go. As far as the prostate goes, you've got to check the nerves in the low back. That's the nerve to the prostate. And you also got to go to an alkaline-based diet. So like super green is an essential source, excellent alkalizing the system, and that would help tremendously. Then you could add things like pumpkin seeds, saw palmetto, that also help bring down the swelling as well. What about organic green tea? Organic green tea is good. Okay. No problem. Mm -hmm. The saying apps are made in the kitchen. If someone followed and wiped out the seven food set, would you expect them to lose weight and get Absolutely. Yes. 
with, it, with exercise or? Exercise of the two, if I had to do exercise or nutrition, nutrition is 80%. Exercise is 20%. Yeah, so, yes.